Piping is critical for modern industry and manufacturing, conducting water, steam, gas, oil, chemicals, and process liquids. That makes pipe fitting skills and knowledge a necessity for today's maintenance personnel. This part will explain how pipe size is measured, what is meant by pipe schedule, and identify common piping materials. Commercial piping is available in sizes from 1 8 inch to 48 inches in diameter, and specialized piping may be even larger. Up to 12 inches, the nominal pipe size, or NPS, refers to the nominal inside diameter, which differs slightly from the actual inside diameter, or ID. Pipe larger than 12 inches is sized by its actual outside diameter, or OD. In addition to the diameter, pipe is also sized according to its wall thickness, or schedule. For pipe up to 12 inches in diameter, Schedule 40 is considered standard wall thickness. Schedule 80 is extra heavy wall thickness, and Schedule 160 is double extra heavy. As the wall thickness increases, the inside diameter decreases. Pipe that is less than Schedule 40 has thinner walls and less strength than standard or Schedule 40 pipe. For pipe that is larger than 12 inches in diameter, standard wall thickness is not a schedule, but means 3 eighths of an inch wall thickness, whatever the OD. Likewise, extra heavy or extra strong pipe has 1 half inch wall thickness, whatever the OD. In addition to the diameter, pipe is also sized according to its wall thickness or schedule. For pipe up to 12 inches in diameter, Schedule 40 is considered standard wall thickness. Schedule 80 is extra heavy wall thickness, and Schedule 160 is double extra heavy. As the wall thickness increases, the inside diameter decreases. Pipe that is less than Schedule 40 has thinner walls and less strength than standard or Schedule 40 pipe. While different types of piping look different, positive identification of piping material should never be based on appearance alone. Piping is identified by ink stamping, or for smaller pipe, by a tag attached to bundles. The identification includes the pipe size, wall thickness, weight per foot, length, specification and grade, manufacturer's name, and method of manufacture for example, seamless or welded. Always check this information to verify you are using the material called for in the work order or job description. The specification and grade of piping are standards for pipe strength and malleability, set by the American Society of Testing and Materials, or ASTM. These standards are used to determine the suitable application of various types of piping, and are generally recognized and approved by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or ASME, and the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI. The American Petroleum Institute, or API, has established separate standards for pipe used in the oil and gas industry. There are specifications for every conceivable piping application. Here are a few common ones. ASTM A120 specifies black iron or galvanized steel piping for normal steam, water, air, and gas line use. ASTM A53 is a general use carbon steel pipe in diameters 1 8 inch through 26 inches, suitable for fabrication and bending. And ASTM A106 is a specification for high pressure or high temperature piping. Prefabricated pipe fittings greatly facilitate the installation of piping systems. They are available for all types of piping material and for most pipe turns and types of connections. Elbows are used for pipe turns of various degrees. Elbows in 90 degree and 45 degree angles are the most common. Street L's have one male and one female end. For branches off of a main piping run, T's and laterals are used. T's join a branch pipe at a 90 degree angle, while laterals, sometimes called Y's, normally connect at a 45 degree angle. T's are made in various configurations, 
With the bull head or branch connection of a different diameter than the pipe run, or with different diameters on each end, and so on. Crosses allow for two 90 degree connections off of a pipe run. Couplings are used to connect two pieces of equal size pipe. Bushings can be used on one side of the coupling so that a pipe run can be reduced with a coupling. But it's more common to use either a concentric reducer or an eccentric reducer when reducing the pipe size in a run. Unions are another way two pieces of pipe can be joined, and they are also a convenient way to connect piping to equipment. A pipe nipple is a piece of pipe 12 inches long or less threaded on both ends. Close nipples are threaded their entire length for close connections. Because they're often needed, maintaining a supply of both is a good idea. Flanges are used to bolt together two pieces of pipe or pipe to valves or other fittings. Like most fittings, they're available for both welded and screwed connections. Plugs and caps are sometimes confused, though they're easy to differentiate. Plugs are used to close female pipe openings, while caps are used to close off the end of a pipe run. Unions are another way two pieces of pipe can be joined, and they are also a convenient way to connect piping to equipment. In this topic, we examined the pipe sizes, materials, specifications, and identifications, and reviewed commonly used pipe fittings and their function. To test your understanding of this material, try answering some practice questions. When repairing a pipe installation, the type of fitting to use is obvious. Simply replace the old one with another of the same type. But the ability to identify pipe fittings on prints and drawings is important. So let's look at how they're usually depicted. Prints are either plan view, which shows the layout of the piping and equipment on each floor from above, or elevation view, which shows the piping and equipment on one floor viewed from one side of the room or building. In this plan view, we can see the piping runs indicated by the straight lines. At turns in the piping, there are fittings. For example, a right angle turn indicates a 90 degree elbow. A 45 degree turn would naturally have a 45 degree fitting. For other turns, the angle of the turn will usually be indicated on the print, as in this angle of 11 degrees and 16 minutes. For a 90 degree branch connection to a piping run, a T is used. It's shown by short lines across the pipe run on either side of the branch, and one across the branch near the pipe run. If the short lines across the pipe aren't present, then the branch is either a weld outlet or a saddle connection directly into the side of the pipe. In a plan view, a vertical run of pipe can be difficult to spot. A 90 degree elbow turned down looks like this, and turned up like this. A T turned down will appear like this, and turned up it will look like this. Unions are depicted by this symbol, and reducers are indicated by these symbols. Whether the fittings are screwed, welded, or flanged is indicated in the bill of materials, usually on the first print in a series. The bill of materials gives the specification and grade required for all materials, plus the size and schedule. The schedule is the wall thickness of pipe. Standard is Schedule 40. Schedules 80, 120, and 160 have progressively thicker walls and progressively smaller inside diameters. The material specifications must be adhered to unless engineering okays a substitution. In this plan view, we can see the piping runs indicated by the straight lines. At turns in the piping, there are fittings. For example, a right angle turn indicates a 90 degree elbow. A 45 degree turn would naturally have a 45 degree fitting. For other turns, the angle of the turn will usually be indicated on the print, as in this angle of 11 degrees and 16 minutes. An elevation view is what we see if we stand at one wall and look across a room or building. It shows the piping and equipment that can be seen from a specific floor elevation. The actual configuration of a piping system can be seen more clearly in this view, 
which shows vertical and horizontal piping runs with distances from the floor elevation indicated. Both views are needed for a clear understanding of the location of equipment and supports and of the route and configuration of the piping system. In this topic, we've seen how blueprints and associated drawings serve as a roadmap to guide maintenance personnel in the efficient and correct installation of piping. To check your understanding of blueprint reading, answer these questions. The folding six-foot rule is commonly used for measuring these distances or for measuring pipe lengths, fitting takeoff, etc. For longer distances or pipe lengths, a retractable tape is used. These come in lengths of 25, 50, or 100 feet. Because piping work requires a high degree of accuracy, measurements are usually made to the nearest sixteenth of an inch. This means that consistency is essential in reading, taking, and expressing measurements. To help ensure that consistency, let's review the basics. One sixteenth of an inch is the shortest length marked on a rule or tape, and is indicated by the shortest vertical lines at the edge of a rule or tape. There are sixteen sixteenths in an inch, so including the inch mark, there are sixteen marks indicating a distance of one sixteenth of an inch each. Obviously, all the sixteenth marks on the rule or tape are not the same length. The graduated lengths of these other marks indicate eighths of an inch, quarters of an inch, and half an inch. It's customary to reduce any fraction of an inch to its lowest expression. So, four sixteenths would be a quarter inch, two fourths would be half an inch, and so on. The folding six-foot rule is commonly used for measuring these distances, or for measuring pipe lengths, fitting takeoff, etc. For longer distances or pipe lengths, a retractable tape is used. These come in lengths of 25, 50, or 100 feet. Because piping work requires a high degree of accuracy, measurements are usually made to the nearest sixteenth of an inch. This means that consistency is essential in reading, taking, and expressing measurements. To help ensure that consistency, let's review the basics. One sixteenth of an inch is the shortest length marked on a rule or tape, and is indicated by the shortest vertical lines at the edge of a rule or tape. There are sixteen sixteenths in an inch, so including the inch mark, there are sixteen marks indicating a distance of one sixteenth of an inch each. Obviously, all the sixteenth marks on the rule or tape are not the same length. The graduated lengths of these other marks indicate eighths of an inch, quarters of an inch, and half an inch. It's customary to reduce any fraction of an inch to its lowest expression. So, four sixteenths would be a quarter inch, two fourths would be half an inch, and so on. Because piping work requires a high degree of accuracy, measurements are usually made to the nearest sixteenth of an inch. To measure a piece of pipe, place the end of the rule at one end of the pipe, with the rule laid flat against the pipe along its length. Read the measurement at the point on the rule adjacent to the other end of the pipe. In this case, the pipe is three feet, four and one half inches long. If the pipe is longer than six feet, make a mark on the pipe where the rule ends. Then slide the rule forward until the zero end of the rule is on this mark. If necessary, repeat this until the unfolded rule extends past the end of the pipe. Read the rule at the point where the pipe ends. To that measurement, add six feet for each time you move the rule. Because of the potential of the rule inadvertently moving off of the mark, a tape measure should be used when possible for measurements over six feet in length. Most tapes and rules have an identifier at each foot mark to help in determining the exact measurement. Although measurements should be written as feet and inches, you may hear them spoken as 42 and one quarter inches instead of three feet six and one quarter inches. It's not that it's wrong to express a measurement that way, in fact, measurements under one foot are almost always expressed as just so many inches and fractions of an inch. 
However, since the person who reads a measurement is often not the one who took it, it's crucial to use the same terminology when calling out or writing down dimensions so measurements are accurate. That's why feet, hyphen, inches, and fractions has become the common standard to avoid misunderstandings about dimensions which waste time and material. Most measurements are center to center, that is, from the center of one fitting to the center of another fitting. This is not the length of the pipe. As you can see in this graphic, the pipe ends are not at the center of the fitting. With screwed, socket weld, and plastic fittings, the pipe ends insert a certain distance into the fitting. This is called makeup. The distance from the made-up end of the pipe to the center of the fitting is called the fitting takeoff. To determine the actual pipe length from a center to center measurement then, you must subtract the takeoff for each fitting from the center to center measurement. Takeoff dimensions vary with pipe size, and tables giving takeoff dimensions for each size pipe can be found in pipe manuals. For example, a one inch socket weld 90 degree elbow is one and a half inches from end to center, dimension A. The makeup, dimension B, is five-eighths of an inch. But with socket welds, the pipe must be backed out one-eighth of an inch to allow for heat expansion. So the true makeup is four-eighths or half an inch. Subtract the half-inch makeup from one and one-half inches, and the takeoff for one fitting is one inch. Since there are two fittings, multiply that by two, and the total takeoff is two inches. Subtract two inches from the center to center measurement and you get the actual length of pipe required. In this case, 10 inches. Again, to figure takeoff, find the end to center dimension for a fitting from the table. Then subtract the makeup or how far the pipe inserts into the fitting. For socket weld fittings, include the allowance for heat expansion. For butt weld fittings, no makeup is involved. So takeoff is the dimension from the end to the center of the fitting. Of course, if the dimension is end to end, that means the actual pipe measurement and takeoff doesn't have to be figured. With screwed, socket weld, and plastic fittings, the pipe ends insert a certain distance into the fitting. This is called makeup. Whatever the identification, it is critical that you pay attention to what is being measured. A length of pipe cut to a center to center dimension will be too long, for example. At least that mistake can be remedied by cutting the pipe, although time is lost. Deducting takeoff from an end to end dimension, however, results in wasted time and wasted material. Make it a practice to always identify piping dimensions. If necessary, they can be translated into other measurements, but the initial dimension must be clear to everyone. A hacksaw is one of the most common methods used on tubing and smaller pipe. It's convenient and quick, and with a little care, results in the square pipe ends required for good fit-up. Let's cut a piece of half-inch pipe to a length of two feet. First, we measure from the end of the pipe and make a mark with soapstone or other marker at exactly two feet. Wrap a square cut piece of gasket material around the pipe at the two feet mark so the edges line up. Use the edge of this wrap around to mark completely around the pipe. Remove the gasket material or pipe wrap. Ensure that the hacksaw blade teeth point away from the handle. Then place the blade on the mark with the saw perpendicular to the pipe. A hacksaw cuts on the downstroke or when pushing it away from you. Begin slowly, continually checking that the blade remains on the mark and perpendicular to the pipe. Some mechanics make a shallow groove on the mark completely around the pipe before they begin applying more force to cut the pipe. This helps keep the blade on the mark. Cuts that are not square usually come from using too much force, trying to hurry the cut. This bends the blade off its intended path. 
For square cuts, use firm, even strokes and continually check the path of the blade. Once the pipe is cut, place a square on the pipe to ensure that the end is cut square. Then file the burrs and remove the filings, which can cause damage to seals and equipment. For larger pipe, generally greater than one and one half to two inches, or for heavy wall piping or tubing, it's common to make cuts with a portable or stationary bandsaw. With a portable bandsaw, the process is the same as with a hacksaw. Take extra care with blade alignment, since the cut is made more quickly and can easily stray off square. Stationary saws are equipped with vice-like locking devices. Once the pipe is marked, ensure that the blade is square and on the mark. Then lock the vise and begin the cut. These saws are balanced so that the cut is made with gradual force, which keeps the cut straight and true. However the cut is made, always file or ream burrs from the pipe ID. When a pipe threading machine is available, the pipe cutting attachment is a convenient and accurate method of cutting pipe. Once the pipe is locked into the machine and rotating, the cutting blades are gradually tightened until the pipe is cut. The cut is straight and true but must be reamed or filed to remove burrs on the inside diameter. Some mechanics make a shallow groove on the mark completely around the pipe before they begin applying more force to cut the pipe. This helps keep the blade on the mark. Cuts that are not square usually come from using too much force, trying to hurry the cut. This bends the blade off its intended path. For square cuts, use firm, even strokes and continually check the path of the blade. In this topic, we saw how to accurately take and express pipe measurements, how to calculate fitting takeoff and makeup, and the proper way to cut pipe using several methods. Test your understanding of this material by answering these practice questions. There are three major considerations when installing pipe and components. First, Horizontal runs must be level, or if they are designed to be sloped, the correct slope must be maintained. Second, vertical runs must be plumb, that is, straight up and down. And finally, pipe runs must be installed so that they are square. That means that 90 degree branches must actually be at a 90 degree angle to the main line and not 87 degrees or 94 degrees. These three musts are accomplished with the basic tools of pipe fitting, the square and the spirit level. To ensure that a vertical run is plumb, place the level along the run of the pipe flush against its side. Note the position of the bubble in the level tube that is now horizontal. Tilt the top of the pipe in the direction of the part of the bubble that is outside the two centering lines until the bubble is completely and exactly within these lines. Then slide the level 90 degrees around the pipe circumference in either direction. Repeat the above step until the bubble is completely and exactly between the lines. Recheck the first side before permanently securing the pipe in place. To ensure that a run is horizontal, simply place the level along the top of the pipe and check the position of the bubble in the horizontal tube. If the bubble is outside the lines, lower the end where the bubble extends past the line or raise the opposite end until the bubble is completely and exactly within both lines. Lines that must be sloped, such as drains, will have engineered specifications such as one-eighth of an inch per foot of horizontal run. Or the elevation on the print at one end of a pipe run will be different from the elevation of the other end of the run. For example, this pipe run begins at elevation 783 feet 6 inches and drops to an elevation of 782 feet 6 inches at the other end, a slope of one foot. This is a slope of approximately one-eighth inch per foot. To ensure that a run is horizontal, simply place the level along the top of the pipe and check the position of the bubble in the horizontal tube. 
if the bubble is outside the lines, lower the end where the bubble extends past the line or raise the opposite end until the bubble is completely and exactly within both lines. With socket weld fittings, a carpenter's square or a combination square can be used to ensure that pipe branches are installed to the correct angle. These pipe fittings are slightly oversized so that pipe can fit easily into them. This excess or play can also cause pipe to be off several degrees from the required angle. To ensure a true 90 degree angle, for example, place the pipe in the T and place the short blade of a carpenter's square on the main line with the edge of the long blade running fairly close along the branch pipe. Near the fitting, measure the distance from the edge of the square to the pipe. It's good practice to select a distance such as one half inch or one inch by sliding the square on the pipe. Then measure the distance between the edge of the square and the pipe at the far end of the long blade. Move the pipe until this measurement is the same as the initial one. Once both measurements are the same, you have a true 90 degree angle and the pipe can be secured in that position by tie wire or by tack welding. This attention to making pipe plumb and square isn't for appearances only. By ensuring square connections, measurements are more exact, less material is used, and less time is required to make the installation 